The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, sorry about missing last time. I had to go home and uh, visit, visit the family. It's been a couple months. Uh, we're going to do kind of a, today's going to be kind of a review session of a bunch of things, and we're also going to uh, uh, go through a dialogue, probably my favorite dialogue, maybe two, um, the Little Harmonic Labyrinth. Um, but I want to start out with uh, kind of just entertaining any questions that people might have burning to ask me right away. Confusion over the past two lectures, or, or what else, what have you? Anything? All right, I'm sure questions will develop. All right, so chapter four, which I asked you guys to have read for the previous lecture, even though you had an entire lecture on recursion, was about three things. It's consistency, completeness, and geometry. Uh, I'm just going to quickly kind of define these three terms as much as they can be defined, uh, and then kind of lead into what the whole point of uh, Chapter 4 was about and what the Cotra-Crostopunctus was trying to introduce you to. And that's really kind of getting these two to go to Gödel's theorem. So. Can anyone tell me what consistency means? Anyone? Sure. If the set is like, if like no theorems contradict each other. Yeah, exactly. So what Felix said was no theorems contradict each other. So basically, if, if we were to put this in terms of a formal system, if we were deriving things, if we were playing with MU or or uh, whatever, whatever formal system we had, and we happened to derive a proposition P, we couldn't somehow simultaneously derive from our set of axioms P, and this means and, not P, that being not P. So basically, if we had a set of operating assumptions, and we were trying to somehow formally predict today's weather, and somehow the computer spit out, well, today it's going to rain and not rain at the same time. Um, that would be kind of an example of an inconsistent system, some things where you derived a contradiction directly. Um, and the thing which is really interesting about this, and I'm not going to go into all the details of it, but if your formal system produces anywhere in it a contradiction, you can derive anything. And this is really kind of a bad thing, because uh, and a lot of philosophers have grappled with this question. Why is it that if, if we derive a statement, say, you know, this table is red and not red, how can we deduce from that that the universe is infinite, right? But somehow, when you have a contradiction, everything goes haywire. You can derive anything, and problems abound. Um, and this is going to be one of the kind of things which Gödel's theorem, Gödel's two theorems, um, and two incompleteness theorems will tell us about. But of course, I use the word incompleteness. What does completeness mean? And this is kind of a harder concept to get across. And it's really, really counterintuitive at first. Um, and it's what, something I want to talk about today. Does anyone have a good definition of completeness? Any takers? Sandra? Do you have an idea? OK. Um, that's all right. So. Completeness is, I think, probably one of the hardest concepts. And it has to go back to, go back to a picture which I, which I drew. Hello. Go ahead and come on in. I've got a handout for you. Um, so completeness goes back to a picture I drew on the first day of lecture. And I don't know if you guys remember it. But it actually appears in a chapter which I didn't assign you all to read. 
Um, inside idea, if we had a truth box, and this truth box was, was somehow um, a, a graphical display of all of our theorems and the things we could tr prove, but things we also knew to be true. Um, so let's take this to be the, uh, the true box. And let's take this to be the not true box. And as we talked, you know, in the past couple of days, if we had if we had some axioms, you know, kind of principal points to start building truths from, um, we can we can derive all sorts of uh, all sorts of ideas from these from this these axioms. Um, and this is just kind of a weird graphical tree. Of, of deductions, right? Just like when we were playing with the MU system, um, we, we started with uh, MI, and then that was our axiom. And then we, we applied all of our rules of inference to get all the possible theorems here. And, and these are things which are, which are provable. Sorry if this is incomprehensibly small, but it says provable. Um, and, but then we have all this space here, which, which we already said were, were true things, but provable things. And this is really kind of a counterintuitive idea. Um, and it really, some of you might go, yeah, that exactly captures one of my, what I feel. Um, and that's the idea that there are truths, things we know to be true, which aren't provable. And this is really kind of hard to wrap your head around. Like suddenly we've got, we have things which we know are true, but how do we know they are true? It's not that we have a proof of them. We just know that they are true. And this really is going to go into Gödel's theorem, big time, Gödel's two incompleteness theorems. Um, and so what completeness, if you want to give it a, give it a short definition, is that uh, every true system derivable in the, is derivable from the axioms or from the system. There, there is no incompleteness. Here, based on this graphical drawing here, we've got obvious incompleteness. We have all the space. We have all these true statements which aren't re reachable from our axioms. Um, can anyone think of something which might be true but not provable? Or they have an idea? Go ahead. Like, uh, if there's anything outside the universe. If there's anything outside the universe. Exactly. Um, that's, that's one idea. I, I was actually just reading the other day in Seth Lloyd's uh, Programming the Universe that the universe, if you kind of look at it, expanded like so from a Big Bang. But the rate at which it expands is four times the speed of light. Of course, the only things we can perceive travel as fast as the speed of light. So we've got kind of this light cone. So everything inside this shaded region are things which we can perceive. But ultimately, the universe is expanding faster than that. So there's all sorts of these things about the universe which we'll never know. And that, that's, that's kind of a, that's a nice physical example. But it's not exactly what I mean in terms of formal systems and completeness and things being true but not provable. Um, and this is going to really kind of, this is the heart of Gödel's theorem. So before we get there, I, I just want to talk briefly about geometry. Um, we're going to meet it in kind of a variety of two settings. In the chapter, you met kind of Euclidean, non-Euclidean, and I want to elaborate on that and just show you some of the cool things. So I'm going to have kind of Euclidean and not Euclidean. But we'll get back to that. Right now, I kind of want to harp on what Gödel's theorem is, who this guy Kurt Gödel was, and why it is that we have one of our three title names. Uh, named after him. So, uh, Kurt Gödel was b born in Vienna. Um, he was a mathematician, and he grew up in a, in a time where, where mathematics was being directly influenced by really a variety of par 